Hello and welcome everyone on behalf of the Cabrillo Festival of Contemporary Music. I wanted to start by giving a little context of why Cabrillo Festival might be hosting this amazing panel discussion on voting rights. The Cabrillo Festival is a contemporary orchestral festival dedicated to the music of contemporary living composers. And with our new music director, Christy Machalaru, coming in 2017, he made a commitment to not only do the music of our time, but music for our time, making it more relevant for more people and tackling the questions and issues that we face today. And in that vein, the Cabrillo Festival commissioned a new work by Stacey Garrett about um, to commemorate the anniversary of the uh, passage of the 19th Amendment. And we will actually, um, because that work was so important at this moment in time, uh, because of the anniversary and being on the threshold of a presidential election, despite the fact that the Cabrillo Festival needed to cancel our live performances, uh, music director Christy Machalaru and our festival orchestra made a commitment to perform a virtual world premiere that will indeed be presented later today. The Battle for the Ballot will premiere uh, later today via our website, and I hope you will all join. Um, it's a very moving piece. And with that, the festival wanted to continue our educational programming that has expanded in large measure because of the very valuable partnerships we have had in recent years with the Humanities Institute at University of California, Santa Cruz, and with um, Peggy and Jack Baskin Foundation Presidential Chair in Feminist Studies. And so um, we are very honored to be able to present all of these panelists today on this important topic of voting rights at this important moment of celebrating women's suffrage in America. And with that, I would like to take a moment to thank our sponsoring partners, the Humanities Institute at University of California, Santa Cruz, Arena Pollich, and her incredible team for their generous support and partnership. The Peggy and Jack Baskin Foundation Presidential Chair in Feminist Studies at UCSC, Bettina Aptekar, without whom none of this would have been possible. She really has been the engine behind this operation and her scholarship and encouragement have been invaluable. And Bookshop Santa Cruz, Casey Coonerty and her team who have also created a wonderful reading list on voting rights available online and reachable through our webpage. We also want to take a moment to extend a special thanks to our co-sponsors, the NAACP, Women Lawyers of Santa Cruz County, and Temple Beth L. And of course, enormous thanks goes to our panelists who we're so excited to hear from now. It is my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Gail Pellerin, County Clerk and Registrar of Voters for Santa Cruz County. Thank you. Good morning, thank you. So 2020 has definitely been a difficult year. The global pandemic, the huge number of deaths and illnesses, racial strife, our plummeting economy, and the lack of capable leadership to address our challenges weigh heavy on all of our minds. As we approach the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment on August 18th and stand at the threshold of a presidential election that is just 86 days away, I'm honored to moderate this panel discussion today, celebrating women's suffrage and the struggle for voting rights. And I welcome all of you to this extraordinary event. I noticed online that there was one word preceding the title of this panel. It is the word rising. It's a simple word, but it is so powerful. It calls upon us to rise against the injustices of the world. We can do this through demonstrating, speaking out, learning from others like we're doing here today, encouraging others, lifting up those behind us so they can rise too, and voting. So it is in the spirit of rising to the challenges and days ahead that I welcome all of our prestigious group of speakers 
Uh, we got Bettina Apiker, who is a scholar, activist, and distinguished professor emerita of the Feminist Studies Department at the University of California at Santa Cruz. Professor Aida Hurtado is the Luis Leal Endowed Chair, Associate Dean, and Professor in the Department of Chicana and Chicano Studies at the University of, of California at Santa Barbara. And Judge Marla Anderson, who is a judge of the Superior Court of California in Monterey, in Monterey County. Our panel will examine the complex history of enfranchisement in the United States and its relevance to the ongoing anti-racist struggle against voter suppression. My name is Gail Pellerin. I'm the Santa Cruz County Clerk Registrar of Voters and I'll be your moderator. Today's event will be followed by a live Q&A, so please stay tuned. Now, before we get started, I just wanna thank Ellen Primack, Tamara Liu, Jacqueline, and Elizabeth Quibby with the Cabrillo Festival of Contemporary Music for organizing this panel and they're doing all the technical work behind the scenes. So we thank you very much. So let's begin with our own Bettina Aptiger. Bettina has taught for 40 years and continues to teach occasional seminars and advises students. Her books include a memoir, Intimate Politics, How I Grew Up Red, Fought for Free Speech and Became a Feminist Rebel, and The Morning Breaks, The Trial of Angela Davis. A scholar activist, Bettina has been engaged in anti-racist, social justice, feminist, and LGBT rights movements for many years. She lives here in Santa Cruz with her wife, Kate Miller. Welcome, Bettina. Thank you so much. I'm absolutely delighted to be here and um, very happy to be able to participate in this wonderful presentation for all of us. I wanna welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining us today, wherever you are in the world. I'm delighted to join my esteemed panelists and to honor the Cabrillo Festival's inaugural performance of the new work by Stacey Garrup uh, tonight, The Battle for the Ballot. For our, ba for our panel, I am tasked with telling a little of the history of how women's suffrage was won. And I emphasize that it's a little history because it was a long struggle and it's a very complicated story. And I've sliced it down to just tell a little piece of it. Um, and I'm gonna focus particularly on the struggle to extend the suffrage to all women. My overriding theme is that the struggle for women's suffrage was completely intertwined with the struggle for black voting rights. In the struggle for women's suffrage protests, marches and parades were frequent and effective, visible, energizing. For example, as you're seeing on the slide, the Women's Suffrage Parade of 1915 was held on October 23rd. 25,000 women marched up Fifth Avenue in New York, all of them dressed in white and blue with a blue sash across the bodice, the colors of the movement. The parade was led by women on horseback, as you can see, made for a dramatic, memorable, exciting event. The suffrage amendment, which had been long since introduced in the Congress, was stalled in committees, especially in the United States Senate, controlled by Southern whites who were rapidly racist. They represented the remnants and descendants of the old slaveholding oligarchy. They were still trying to undo and nullify the 15th Amendment, granting black men the right to vote. And insofar as possible, they wanted to suppress any notion of expanding suffrage rights, much less to women. While the suffrage women worked for the federal amendment to the United States Constitution, they also conducted campaigns to win suffrage at the state level. The annual parades were intended to keep suffrage front and center in tandem with congressional and state legislative campaigns. Meanwhile, on the civil rights front, next slide, the NAACP organized marches also on Fifth Avenue. Here's one of them. Uh, you see the picture here now of the NAACP silent march against lynching held on July 23rd, 1917. Men were in the lead and the drummers kept up the steady cadence of both mourning and resolution. The men were followed by women and children. Next slide, please. Nearly 10,000 participated in this march, which was urgently called after whites rioted in East St. Louis killing and injuring scores of black residents and burning black homes and businesses. The NAACP was largely in support of women's suffrage and black men in Northern and Western cities could vote and they were passionately urged to do so. 
Woman suffrage was on the ballot in New York in November 1917, just after that march, and it won. The black vote helped its success. The black vote was also important in California in 1911 and in Pennsylvania in 1915, where campaigns for woman suffrage were successful. Ida B. Wells, next slide please. Ida B. Wells was a journalist and <clears throat> activist who led an international crusade against lynching. She was an ardent supporter of woman suffrage. Among her many works was a book called A Red Record, published in 1895. Here, Wells made the vital connection between lynching and suffrage. She wrote, the government which had made the Negro a citizen found itself unable to protect him. It gave him the right to vote, but denied him the protection which would have sustained and maintained that right. Scourged from his home, hunted through the swamp, hung by midnight riders and openly murdered in the light of day. The Negro clung to his right of franchise with a heroism that would have wrung admiration from the hearts of savages. He believed that in the small white ballot, there was a subtle something which stood for manhood as well as citizenship. And thousands of brave black men went to their graves exemplifying the one by dying for the other. Wells estimated that there had been some 10,000 black men and women murdered in the South by white mobs between 1865 and 1900. As an activist for woman suffrage, he founded the Af Alpha Suffrage Club in Chicago and marched in the 1913 Woman Suffrage Parade in New York over the objections of some white Southern women. Her white sisters from the Chicago March delegation simply pulled her into the line of march to join them. Wells exemplified the understanding that woman suffrage and black suffrage were in forever intertwined and that neither could be one or sustained without the other. Mary Church Terrell, another activist, there's her wonderful picture, from 1906. She was born in 1863, enslaved, freed at the end of the, end of the war, and uh, with emancipation, and she lived for 90 years. She died in 1954. Mary Church Terrell was the founding president of the National Association of Colored Women in 1896 with the slogan, Lifting As We Climb. She was also a founding member of the NAACP in 1909. She was a fervent participant in the struggle for woman suffrage and a frequent speaker at its national conventions of the National American Woman Suffrage Association. Her first such appearance was on February 18th, 1898 at the Columbia Theater in an, in, in an address where she said, 50 years ago, a meeting such as this, planned, conducted, and addressed by women would have been an impossibility. Less than 40 years ago, few sane men would have predicted that either a slave or one of his descendants would in this century at least address such an audience in the nation's capital at the invitation of women representing the highest, broadest, best type of womanhood that can be found anywhere in the world. Thus to me, this semi-centennial of the National American Woman Suffrage Association is a double jubilee rejoicing as I do not only in the prospective enfranchisement of my sex, but in the emancipation of my race. Next slide, please. Carrie Chapman Catt. Carrie Chapman Catt was an indefatigable, brilliant organizer hailing from Wisconsin. She embraced the woman suffrage movement and became an outstanding speaker and organizer. Beginning in 1915 as president of the National American Woman Suffrage Association, Catt led a national campaign that finally won congressional adoption of the suffrage amendment to the Constitution, first in the House on January 10th, 1918, and then in the Senate on June 4th, 1919. Now, what was required was ratification, as many of you know, by three-fourths of the state legislatures. Kate devised what she Kat devised what she called the winning plan, which carefully coordinated state suffrage campaigns with the drive for the constitutional amendment. She had a big black book, literally, 
in which was inscribed the names of every man in every state legislature and the names of all of his female relatives. The suffrage partisans in every state went about the business of talking with those female relatives to urge them to pressure their men to vote in favor of the amendment. Symbolic of what the whole century of struggle had been about, the last battle for ratification was fought out in the former slaveholding state of Tennessee. After a bitter struggle in which the enfranchisement of black people was the underlying issue, the Tennessee legislature voted its approval of the woman's suffrage amendment on August 18, 1920, by one vote. The deciding vote was cast by a man named Hugh Burns. When asked later why he voted for it, he said that his mother told him to, and I quote, always did what mother said. After the final victory, Carrie Chapman Catt summarized the meaning of their labors and the suffrage victory. She said, it is doubtful if any man, even among suffrage men, ever realized what the suffrage struggle came to mean before the end was allowed in America. How much of time and patience, how much work and energy, aspiration, how much faith, how much hope, how much despair went into it. It leaves its mark on one such a struggle. It fills the days and rides the nights. Working, eating, drinking, sleeping it is there. Most women in all the states were at least aware, at least on the periphery of its efforts and interest when they were not in the heart of it. To them, its success became a monumental success. But not all women won the right to vote in August 1920. Next slide, please. Gertrude Simmons Bronin was uh, born in the Yankton Sioux Reservation in South Dakota. Her Lakota name was Zikala Sa, which means red bird. Bronin was a strong advocate and organizer for women's suffrage, and many Native women were actually involved in the suffrage movement in various ways. Educated at a Quaker boarding school, she was later a graduate of Earlham College. After the ratification of the 19th Amendment, Gertrude Simmons Bronin reminded the rejoicing newly enfranchised white women that the fight was not over. Native women could not vote. Indeed, Native Americans did not become citizens of the United States until 1924. It was the Native women suffragists, Bronin among them, who organized and pressed for passage of what was called the Snyder Act of 1924, which extended US citizenship to all Native people. Indigenous scholars note, however, that, quote, in response, many states enacted Jim Crow-like policies aimed at disenfranchising Indians. In 1926, Bronin founded the National Council of American Indians, which identified land and resource issues facing Indian people. Throughout her lifetime, Bronin served as a spokesperson for self-determination and the values of Indian culture. Next slide, please. Fannie Lou Hamer. With the victory of women's suffrage in 1920, black women in the South went by the thousands to register to vote. They were not even admitted into the courthouse. Just as black men had been so brutally disenfranchised for generations, so black women were also prevented from voting by whatever means necessary. Women's suffrage was a momentous victory, but it would be another 45 years before black suffrage was won in the South with passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Fannie Lou Hamer was a sharecropper from Ruleville, Mississippi. When she and other black women tried to register to vote in 1963, they were thrown off their land. Then she and others were arrested. In jail, she was brutally beaten. She suffered severe internal injuries and was hospitalized for a considerable time. Once back on her feet, she resumed her work with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Folks said she was completely fearless, determined, and believed in the will of God. With black folks unable to vote, the Democratic Party primary elections in Mississippi and elsewhere in the South were all white. Mrs. Hamer determined to change that and organized with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee something called the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. She was its driving force and main strategist. She led their elected delegates to the National Democratic Party Convention in August 1964 and challenged the all-white Mississippi Democrats. 
However, the convention's rules committee refused to give credentials to the Freedom Democrats. Members of the New York delegation gave a seat to Mrs. Hamer to allow her to enter the convention floor and testify before the credentials committee. She gave a powerful speech on the meaning of democracy broadcast on national television. She told her audience story of trying to register to vote and the details of the terrible beating she had sustained. And then she said, all of this is on account we want to register to be first class citizens. And if the Freedom Democratic Party is not seated now, I question America. Is this America, the land of the free and the home of the brave, where we have to sleep with our telephones off the hook because our lives be threatened daily because we want to live as decent human beings in America? Mrs. Hamer was not seated, nor were the Freedom Democrats credentials, nor were they allowed to vote. But her speech galvanized the country, and in its aftermath, the Democratic Party was very soon to be transformed. The 1965 Voting Rights Act, with its strict provisions for federal jurisdiction in determining voting protocols and laws in those states with a history of racial violence and black disfranchisement, finally succeeded in establishing voting rights for black women and men in the South. That's how black women won suffrage a century after the end of slavery and 45 years after the of women's suffrage. In conclusion, Republicans today are doing everything they can to suppress the voting rights once again. But we are living in a moment of great reckoning about race in this country. There is so much trauma, so much rage, so much grief, and so much ongoing suffering and yet at the same time, there is so much courage, strength, and resilience. And the battle for the ballot, the title of tonight's premier performance, goes on. Thank you so much for the opportunity to participate in this panel. Thank you, Bettina. So our next speaker is Dr. Aida Hurtado. She is a social psychologist and author of The Color of Privilege, Voicing Chicana Feminisms Beyond Machismo and Intersectional Chicana Feminisms. Professor Hurtado spoke at the 2017 and 2018 Women's March and served on the Women's March Steering Committee. She has served as a consultant to the Ford Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, and the Kellogg Foundation. Please welcome Dr. Hurtado. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, I thank to all the participants and organizers of this event. It is truly miraculous to gather us for such an important anniversary with such creativity and collaboration. I especially thank Professor Bettina Epsecker. I always learn from her every time I hear her speak, uh, but I thank her specifically for extending the invitation to participate with this distinguished uh, panel. I have to come, uh, next slide please. Um, I have to confess that every time I have voted, I have cried as I filled out the ballot. I come from an immigrant family where the privilege of voting was never taken for granted. Living on the US-Mexican border taught us as a family the precarious nature of nation states and the fragility of our democratic rights on both sides of the border. My emotions were particularly high in 2008 when I voted for Barack Obama and again in 2012. However, the 2016 presidential election was particularly emotional as many of us had worked many years on feminist causes and we savored the possibility of seeing the first woman become president of the United States. Next slide, please. I could hardly sleep the night before the election in anticipation of driving to cast my ballot. This photo was taken in Santa Cruz on November 8th, 2016 at 6.49 AM. And I was wearing my sparkly LA shoes when my husband and I were on our way out the door to vote. I wore white and in a celebration to what we all thought would be an electoral victory. Next slide, please. 
For me and my family, elections at all levels have been personal. The feminist movement alerted us that the personal is political. That is, that what happens inside the private sphere had political implications. Who did the housework? Who took care of kids? Who carried the emotional labor necessary for families and communities to survive was a gender process that landed primarily on the shoulders and souls of women. This was certainly true of women of all races, ethnicities, and even class, of course, with the support of economic privilege playing a strong role. However, for my family and for my community, the political was also deeply personal. Who had political power intervened in our lives at all levels? Next slide, please. When, when marriage equality was on the balance multiple times in the past decade, next slide please. The outcome affected my sister and her wife and their boys. We feared for their safety and their well-being. Next slide, please. When Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta were organizing farm workers, we knew that their unions, unionization efforts, next slide, please, determine whether my father, Guadalupe Hurtado, had health insurance, a decent wage, and even restroom facilities on the fields where he worked. Next slide, please. Most recently, the struggle to ensure that DACA was not overturned by this administration affected many of the students in my Chicana and Chicano Studies classes as many of them walked anxiously to find, waited anxiously to find out whether they would be deported after they had lived most of their lives in this country. Next slide, please. The feeling that the political is personal is what mobilized many of us to march in Washington, D.C. the day after the presidential inauguration. As we boarded planes, cars, public transportation, or walked to the march, we did not have a set agenda. We did not have a set of goals. Mostly we were saying, not in our name, will this administration turn back the gains that we as voters have painstakingly fought for, beginning with the struggle to gain voting rights. This aerial photograph is a small slice of the over 4 million uh, in attendance nationwide, not counting the hundreds of marches worldwide. Next slide, please. In fact, the idea of the march began with the assertion that we will not let our representation be invisible. The organizers represented the many constituencies that compose an intersectional feminist movement. And again, I was reminded that the political is personal is one of the main organizers of the march. Next slide, please. Was my former student, Carmen Perez. <clears throat> Carmen is the executive director of the Gathering for Justice, an organization building a movement to end child incarceration while working to eliminate racial inequities in the criminal justice system. Together with the other organizers, they adhere to the notion of an intersectional justice paradigm where we make visible all the intersections of inequality and we fight together in collaboration. Next slide, please. Carmen's political work was personal Next slide, please. Carmen's political work was personal to me, not only uh, because she's a former slug with a BA in psychology from UCSC. Next slide, please. Next, because, but she had taken my course on Chicano feminisms, uh, the first ever taught at UCSC in the fall of 2000. I taught the course from a personal perspective that embodied my politics and my experiences with multiple sources of inequality for my family and my community. Next slide, please. Every vote, but she had, uh, every vote we cast is a reclamation of our right to determine 
our future for ourselves and for those we care for. We are in solidarity with others and as feminist writer Sheree Moraga claims, we do not rank the oppressions. What is done unto you is also done unto me. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Most recently, we have lost a champion of voting rights, uh, John Lewis. He claimed that democracy is always in the making. It is not something we possess or arrive at, but that is renewed, affirmed, and recreated with each subsequent election. Former President Obama urged us during John Lewis's eulogy to not look at Lewis' legacy, but at the agenda that we have inherited from his struggles. He proposed the following steps for remaking our democracy, passing the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, making sure every American is automatically registered to vote, including former inmates who have earned their second chance, adding polling places and expanding early voting and making election day a national holiday. So if you are someone who is working in a factory or a single mother who has, who has a job she can't leave, they can still cast their ballot. Guaranteeing that every American citizen has equal representation, including American citizens who live in Washington, DC and in Puerto Rico. Ending gerrymandering so that all voters have the power to choose their politicians, not, not the other way around. This is an ambitious agenda and these are difficult times. It is not easy to see a path forward. Like Michelle Obama recently discussed, many of us are living under a low grade depression. These feelings of despair and hopelessness are not new to me. Every election I have voted in has been with a mixture of dread and hope that the X on the ballot box will take those I love and those I don't even know to a better place. When I was young, I would dwell in this despair. And my father, who never earned minimum wage, would chuckle and say, mija, social change is like Mexican dancing. Dos pasitos para adelante y un pasito para atrás. Two small steps, steps forward and one step backwards. The important thing, he reminded me, is never stop dancing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hurtado. So we will now hear from Judge Marla Anderson. Judge Anderson is a judge of the Superior Court of California in Monterey County, where she has served for more than 25 years and has presided over a variety of trial calendars, including criminal law, family law, juvenile law, probate, and civil law. During her tenure as presiding judge, she instituted a strategic plan to improve judicial administration. She's a member of the Judicial Council of California, the policy-making body of California's courts. Welcome, Judge Anderson. Hello, and, and thank you so much. And it has been my pleasure to participate on this panel and be a participant with uh, Bettina Aftiker as well as Dr. Aida Hurtado. And what I'm gonna do is just take a few moments to take a look at some of the landmark cases of the United States Supreme Court. Since the 1870s, Congress has enacted laws applicable to the states to protect against disenfranchisement and discrimination in voting and thereby increasing participation. So we're gonna take a brief look at the United States Supreme Court decisions that interpret the constitutionality of these laws and in turn, impact the voting rights landscape. We'll take our next slide. Our next slide. And the first uh, case we'll take a look at is that's the United States versus Creekshank. This was decided in 1875. This is one of the first cases to address uh, voting rights and the constitutionality of Congress's uh, ability to enact laws. Uh, this case arose out of the 1873 Colfax massacre of African-American men over a political dispute that resulted in three white men being convicted of violating the 1870 Enforcement Act. And what was interesting about this case, it was a hotly contested gubernatorial race. And at that time, 
the Republican Party was the party that was uh, in charge of enforcing rights of uh, African Americans uh, post Civil War and during the construction. And it was interested in making sure that African Americans weren't disenfranchised or African American men, actually, weren't disenfranchised from voting. And there was a gubernatorial race where it was uh, not known uh, the next day after election who won. Republicans thought that they won the gubernatorial race. The Democrats at that time, who had a large uh, participation of Ku Klux Klan members, thought that they had won the gubernatorial race. Well, a group of African-American men armed themselves and went to protect the courthouse in Colfax. And then uh, you had uh, Ku Klux Klan members who came who were upset. And then there was approximately one to 200 people who died, African-Americans who died. And three men, white men, were charged with uh, disenfranchising the rights of the African-American men. And it went all the way up to the United States Supreme Court. The men were convicted, uh, criminal conviction of uh, denying the constitutional rights of these African-American men because they uh, denied their right to assemble, and they also denied the right to bear arms as well as denied the right to participate in the voting process. And in this case, Chief Justice Morrison Waite uh, wrote the opinion for the court and overturned the convictions of the three white men. And the basis for overturning those convictions was that the government of the United States is one of delegated powers alone and its authority is defined and limited by the constitution and all powers not granted to it by the constitution are reserved to the states or the people. And these convictions were set aside because really what the decision meant was that your individual rights as well as any rights under the state should be fought out in the states. And it's not to be uh, taken care of by Congress. The Congress does not have that power, at least at this time in 1875, the court interpreted that Congress did not have the power to enact a law to protect the disenfranchisement of the individuals uh, that lived within the states and that Congress didn't have the right to tell the state what to do. There wasn't a particular constitutional provision that gave them that power. And so the convictions were overturned and the court had decided and the landscape was it's whatever happens in your particular state, then you have to go to your state courts and your state government to protect your rights. So since then, we'll take the next slide. After this decision in 1875, you can just imagine what happened to disenfranchisement and what happened to violence. Uh, at, at that time, then the Ku Klux Klan rose and then uh, African-Americans were subject to violence and abuse. And what the Enforcement Act of 1870 had done, which the court had determined that it was an unconstitutional power of Congress, was it criminalized the obstruction of a citizen's voting rights and provided federal supervision over the electoral process including voter registration. So this was the first time you saw Congress trying to protect the rights of minority voters, specifically African-Americans, and to make sure that there was not discrimination and disenfranchisement. And those were provided by the post-Civil War Reconstruction Amendments, the 13th Amendment, which uh, prohibited slavery, as well as the 14th Amendment, which granted the citizenship to those who were born or latronized in the United States, and the 15th Amendment, which uh, provided the right to vote that it's not to be denied or abridged on account of race, color, or previous servitude. And so that was a landmark case, which really changed the landscape of voter participation as well as assembly of minorities in that, unless you had a state that protected you, you really didn't have much by way of any right or any type of enforcement against it because at that time, uh, Congress was deemed not to have the congressional power to provide those protections. So we'll now take a look at another US Supreme Court case and next slide. And our next case should be Katzenbach versus Morgan. This is a 1966 case, and this is a case decided after at least three uh, voting rights acts that were uh, enacted uh, by Congress, uh, inclusive of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Here in the Katzenbach case, uh, registered voters in New York brought a suit uh, against Katzenbach, who was the attorney general at the time. And they were upset because the Voting Rights Act of 1965 had a provision in it that said any uh, Puerto Rican who was uh, educated in a Puerto Rican school and up to the sixth grade, there was a presumption that they were literate enough. And, and at this time, there were literacy laws uh, still in place uh, until the uh, Voting Rights Act of 1965. And in this case, uh, 
the voters were upset to say, why should somebody who doesn't speak the language be permitted to vote? And Congress exceeded its powers under the 14th Amendment, as well as the 10th, 10th Amendment that reserves rights to the states uh, by passing the Voting Rights Act that permitted folks who did not uh, speak English, who spoke Spanish, a, a Puerto Rican heritage, to be presumed to be literate and be entitled to vote by the fact that they had a sixth grade education in Puerto Rico. And Justice uh, William Brennan wrote the decision for the court. And this is the first time you see the uh, United St States Supreme Court not narrowly defining the constitution, but expanding the powers of Congress under the constitution to the degree the expansion was, is that Congress under the 14th amendment does have the right to be able to protect the rights of the citizens not only of the United States, but of the individual states, even though their rights reserved by the state. And Justice Brennan decided in his decision for the court said the enforcement powers granted to Congress under the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause, which requires equal treatment for everyone under the law, specifically gives Congress the ability to pass legislation with the enforcement of state citizens' civil rights as a purpose of the legislation. So this decision broadened the powers of Congress and looked at a more expansive view of interpretation of the Constitution empowerment of Congress's ability to protect state citizens civil rights as a goal of legislation. Next slide. And here we have uh, the Civil Rights Act first uh, that were enacted by Congress to protect the voting rights of citizens. We had the Civil Rights Act of 1957 that authorized the Attorney General to sue for injunctive relief to protect racial minorities. You had the Civil Rights Act of 1964 that mandated that registrars equally administer literacy tests in writing. And that's the time when you had literacy tests to each voter and create a rebuttable presumption. Again, that persons with a sixth grade education were sufficiently literate to vote. And the Landmark Voting Rights Act of 1965, which prohibited states and local governments from imposing voting laws that result in discrimination, outlawed literacy tests, added special provisions for preclearance requirements and a coverage formula. And what the uh, Voting Rights Act of 1965 is it recognized that there was discrimination out there and that there were certain states and certain jurisdictions that had engaged in voter suppression. And so there was a formula that was devised at that time to be able to put those jurisdictions and states on a list where you had to seek permission from the US Attorney General or from a panel of the United States District Court in the District of Columbia for preclearance to change any of your voting rights laws or how voting took place within the state and with the goal of assuring that uh, discrimination was not part and parcel and the main goal of that particular state law. Next slide. And we should have uh, Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission in 2010. And this is also a landmark case uh, that uh, changed the landscape of uh, enfr enfranchisement and disenfranchisement of voters. And in this case, it was a nonprofit organization called Citizens United uh, that made a disparaging film about then candidate Hillary Clinton. And they wanted to run this advertisement during the 2008 election. However, the Federal Elections Campaign Act banned corporations and unions from spending money and amassing money uh, to advocate during the election. At 60 days before general election or 30 days before a primary, you couldn't run ads uh, against an, a candidate who was running for office and corporations weren't allowed to do so. Well, the nonprofit organization of Citizens United uh, then went ahead and sued in court and Justice Anthony Kennedy wrote the decision for the court, which changed the landscape of how much money you have and how much you can advocate uh, for a particular candidate. And the decision was that corporations and unions can spend as much money as they like to convince people to vote for or against political candidates, as long as the spending is independent of the candidate. So a corporation or a union can amass as much money as they'd like, run it whatever campaign that they would like like to run in terms of advertising, as long as they're independent from any particular uh, candidate and they disclose who they are. And this ruling gave corporations and unions the right to free speech protection under the First Amendment. And this changed the landscape to the degree that it added money 
now to advertising. Those who can amass money can control what advertising is out there because you know individually uh, citizens aren't able to amass that money themselves in order to do election advertising. So this is uh, something that changed the landscape. Next slide. And another landmark case that uh, impacted the landscape of voter rights is Shelby County versus Holder. And this was decided in 2013. And this was an opinion uh, written and authored by Chief Justice John Roberts. Shelby County in Alabama was a covered jurisdiction. And what a covered jurisdiction was is under the Voting Rights Act of 1965, uh, if you were a jurisdiction, that under the formula, you were determined to have previously engaged in voter suppression or discriminatory laws in voting, then the formula placed you under the 1965 Voting Rights Act, and you needed to get preclearance in order to change uh, any of your voting laws or any of your rules with respect to voting. And Section 5 of the 1965 Voting Rights Act uh, is the process by which you can get out of preclearance. Well, in Shelby County, they decided to go ahead and sue the U.S. Attorney General in the District Court of District of Columbia, and they sought a declaratory judgment that Section 4B and Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act of 1965 are facially unconstitutional and a permanent injunction against their enforcement. And again, the act established a formula to identify those areas of the county where racial discrimination and voting had been more prevalent as well as provide for more stringent remedies where appropriate. Well, uh, Chief Justice John Roberts authored for the court saying that the coverage formula set forth in section 4B of the act was unconstitutional. And as a consequence, no jurisdictions are now subject to the coverage formula portions of the act and there's no need for a bailout request. And the bailout request was under section five is how do you uh, get the preclearance and or how do you bail out to say, we have uh, come a long way and we have enforced the rights of our voters. And so we should not uh, be under the coverage formula. That was the bailout section. The court held that section 4B exceeded Congress's power to enforce the 14th and 15th amendments. And the court reasoned that the coverage formula conflicts with the constitutional pr uh, principles of federalism and equal sovereignty of the states because the desperate treatment of the states is based on 40 year old facts having no logical relationship to the present day and thus is not responsive to the current needs. And what that means in sum is the court says your data is old and since your data is old, then there isn't a compelling reason uh, to impose the 14th and 15th amendment uh, act. Uh, on the states. Uh, pretty much, I guess the court was indicating that the data of discrimination was old. I think that they were specifically focusing on not that the data of racial discrimination is old because that remains the same, but they were for, uh, looking at the data of who was on the list and the data about the specific state or jurisdiction placing it on the list was old. And so since it was old, then the application of Section 4B was unconstitutional to the states. And that has changed the landscape because since uh, Shelby County versus Holder, uh, we now see a lot of different laws being enacted in the varying states concerning changing uh, voter laws and not having any oversight with respect to those changes. Next slide. And then we have a more recent case in 2018, and this is Houston versus A. a. Philip Randolph Institute. And A. Philip Randolph Institute was a civil rights organization group that filed suit on behalf of an individual voter. And Houston was the uh, uh, Secretary of State for Ohio. And Ohio has enacted a law that purges your uh, voter rolls if someone has not uh, voted in three consecutive uh, federal elections. And they'll send them a postcard to the address that they have. They don't have a, a method to determine whether or not the voter has received the mail, but they just send a postcard out. If the voter does not respond to the postcard and hasn't uh, voted in the last three federal election, consecutive elections, then they're purged. Since enactment of this particular law in Ohio, Ohio has purged over 2 million voters from their rolls. And this decision was offered, authored by uh, Justice Samuel Alito. 
and his decision in this matter, he upheld the Ohio law, the court upheld it, it's a five to four vote, because Ohio sent a notice to those people that it suspected had moved rather than purging voters automatically, the state was in compliance. They looked at it strictly to the letter of the law with the National Voter Registration Act. And that act mandated that states to provide opportunities for voter registration and prohibits removing voters from the roll simply for not voting. So the court looked at this very, very narrowly to say, you sent a postcard, whether they received it or not is another question. And whether you have proof uh, that it's the correct address is, a, is another question. The only thing that matters is you sent the postcard. After you sent the postcard, no response, then uh, those voters could be purged from your voter rolls. And so that also has uh, changed the landscape uh, in Ohio with respect to uh, voter enfranchisement in that if you, such in this case, the uh, person who, real party and in interest, the person who sued, wanted to vote in the 2015 election, didn't know he was dropped from the voter registration list. He had voted uh, early on, I believe in, it was in 2008, but hadn't voted in 2012, didn't vote in 2014, uh, and didn't vote in 2010. And so he was dropped. And so this is where the suit came from is, hey, I want to vote, but you dropped me. So now I have to start from square one. But the court indicated that the Ohio law is constitutional because it sent you a postcard, whether you got it or not, the court didn't look at that, it's, they sent it, and so you were properly purged. Next case. And then we have the Republican National Committee versus the Democratic National Committee. And this is a recent case in April of 2020. And this was a decision on a preliminary injunction. Uh, the uh, district judge in Wisconsin uh, on an application for preliminary injunction ordered extension of the deadline for absentee ballots to be submitted, as well as the time for the registrar to receive those ballots uh, in the April 7 Wisconsin election. And the Democratic National Convention and some other groups as well had requested that the, ex the extension of time to permit more voters to participate in the election because of the COVID pandemic. And what had happened was just a few weeks before the April 7 election in Wisconsin and the pandemic COVID had been raging and so there was a request from the court. The specific request was to extend the deadline by which voters only, I believe it was three days, they wanted extension of time for voters to actually request an absentee ballot and get it in the mail because voters were became, becoming afraid to get in line because of COVID. Well, what the district court had done is not only granted their request to extend the time by which a voter could ask for an absentee ballot as well as uh, mail it in, the court also extended the time by where the registrar voter could actually receive the actual vote. And uh, then uh, the Republican National uh, Committee uh, filed uh, a request in the United States Supreme Court to stay the injunction for that election. And the court uh, decision was by changing the election rules so close to the election date, that means by the district judge uh, changing the rules of allowing folks to request absentee ballots uh, in such a short amount of time to the election, as well as affording relief that the plaintiffs had not asked for. And that was the preliminary injunction that what the district court judge was, is added also the provision that the registrar voters could receive uh, an, an extended time to receive the votes. The district court had uh, contravened this court's precedence. What the Supreme Court was saying is we have precedence and the district court did not follow our precedence and erred by ordering the relief. The court indicated that the change in the registrar's deadline to receive ballots was a change in the election rules too close to the election and then granted the stay. So then those folks who wanted to have an absentee ballot could not get those because of the COVID. It was um, that time for them to just get in line and vote. And the next slide, please. And on the horizon, you just need to take a look at is De uh, Texas Democratic Party versus Abbott. And this is a Texas law that permits voters over the age of 65 to request absentee ballots without difficulty. But most folks under the age of 65 aren't allowed to vote absentee. And this uh, case raises the applicability of the 26th Amendment prohibition against abridging the right of citizens to vote that are 18 years or older. We need to take a look at that. That's on the horizon and Merrill versus People, versus, uh, People First of Alabama. 
This is also an Alabama law that allows anyone to cast an absentee ballot during the pandemic, but it also imposes certain restrictions. One, you have to provide a copy of your photo ID, as well as you need to have two witnesses or a notary to sign your absentee in order for it to be counted. So those are things that are on the horizon. The next slide. And just want to let everybody know, vote. It's your right. And we are celebrating 100 years of the 19th Amendment. And thank you. Thank you, Marla. So now I'm going to present a few slides about what's coming up in, like I said, 86 days. We're going to have the November 3rd election. So you can just move that to the next slide there. And um, so I guess the first question, and I, I'm so sorry that we have to even say this, but yes, the election will be held on November 3rd. Uh, this is something that Congress passed um, years ago and it has never been changed. And the president cannot unilaterally decide to cancel the election, even if it's martial law. Martial law does not suspend the constitution. Um, and remember, we're not voting for president. We're actually voting for electors who will represent our state at the electoral college. And um, federal law states that if the electoral college does not vote on the set date, the president and vice president's terms will automatically expire at noon on January 20th, um, 2021. And then control of the presidency would go down in the line of succession first to the speaker of the house if that election does take place and then to the president pro tem of the Senate. Next slide. So in California, ballots will be mailed to all voters in the state, and that is pursuant to Newsom's executive orders. He did two of them, and there's been subsequent legislation to codify that into our statutes. And mailing ballots to all voters is intended to preserve the public health due to the COVID-19 pandemic and to ensure that the November election is accessible to everybody, secure, safe for all Californians, so you can vote safely from your own homes, there also will be in-person voting options as well. So counties are gonna be mailing their ballots to all voters by October 5th, and our military and overseas ballots will be sent out to those on the voter file starting September 4th, so coming up very quickly. And counties will encourage the remote accessible vote by mail ballot system for military and overseas voters, and that allows them to access their ballot via email, mark it, and then fax it back to us. Um, and mail is going to be used for our military and overseas as a last resort. So our big push is to stay safe and vote from home. Next slide. So we're basically saying there's three easy steps to uh, make sure you are a registered voter. Sign up, of course, sign up to vote or update your information at registertovote.ca.gov. Check up. This is something really important that all of us need to do. You need to go online to voterstatus.sos.ca.gov and check to make sure that you are registered at the correct address. If you have a mailing address, that will be provided there as well. If there's any changes, you can just click the link to go in and make the changes through the register to vote link there. And then we also want to encourage voters to sign up to track your ballot. This is a new thing that's being offered statewide. Uh, every county is going to have some tracking method. So you just go, you can go there today, whereismyballot.sos.ca.gov, and you sign up to get alerts via text or email. So you'll always know what's happening with your ballot. Next slide. On returning your ballot, um, so just because it's confusing when we use the word vote by mail uh, because it doesn't dictate that you return it by mail. It only says that we're mailing it to you. And as you heard from our other speakers there, uh, sometimes uh, states use the word absentee. And that's because you actually have to be absent from your precinct to uh, request it and it's very limited. But in, in California, all, all voters will be mailed a ballot and uh, to return it, you gotta make sure you sign the envelope, make sure you sign it in your own handwriting, don't let someone else sign it for you. And you can drop it off at any ballot drop box provided by the county elections official that the, the ratio is one for every 15,000 voters. You can also drop it off in person at any voting location that will be operating and all county elections offices in the state open starting October 5th for voting. If you do mail it, postage is paid in California, but due to concerns about mail delivery, 
uh, we are encouraging people to mail it a week before the election and make sure it's postmarked. If you do mail it closer to election day, including on election day, I would actually walk it into the post office and make sure it gets stamped and then go ahead and put it in the mail cycle. And any voter in the state of California can return their ballot to any drop box or voting location in the state of California. And if you can't return it yourself, uh, enlist the help of someone you trust. Uh, they will need to provide their name, signature, and relationship to you on the ballot envelope. So next slide, please. So there's five different voting models that you're going to see in the state of California. Some are going to be doing traditional polling sites where voters are assigned to a location. It's roughly one to, for 10,000 voters. They're open Tuesday only and voters are assigned to go to that location. Some counties due to COVID because locations are not readily available, nor are people to staff these locations. So we have to be a little more careful in, in how we plan this election. So we do have legal authority now to super consolidate voting locations at a ratio of one to 10,000 voters. And in some counties are gonna assign voters to go to a location and they need to be open a minimum of four days, Halloween through election day, and ballots would be specific to that assigned voting location. The super consolidated voting location model is what we are doing here in Santa Cruz County. Again, the ratio is one to 10,000, but voters can go to any location. So any voter can go to any location and obtain a second ballot or do same day voter registration or get voter assistance, vote on the accessible tablet or get a, a ballot in Spanish on our tablet. Um, but we do need to be connected to our database and we do have to have capability for on-demand printing. And again, we'll be open the minimum four days. Uh, and some are doing a, a combination of those above models. And then we do have vote center counties where there's 15 counties in the state that have um, been doing all mail ballot elections where they mail ballots to all their voters and voters can go to any location. And the vote centers are defined by the Voters' Choice Act and vote center counties using them have developed uh, election plans reviewed by the public and they will be open a minimum of four days as well. Next slide, please. So just, I just want to quickly go through the maps of the state of California. I figure there will probably be people watching this from all over the state. So these are the different models that the counties are looking at deploying right now. Uh, next slide shows you that the rural smaller counties are more likely to do a traditional polling place model. And then the next slide is, um, and then counties like us who are exploring this, these vote center, vote center-like um, models as well. And then the next slide. So the safeguards of voting using the ballot mail to you, uh, we do have the law that says that ballots that are postmarked on or before election day or time stamp, but we then and received by us now, the law changed to 17 days after the election. It used to be three days. So now we have 17 days after the election, which is good because we have seen mail take up to 10 days to make sure that we get that ballot and it would be considered received on time. We also check the signature on every single ballot. We compare it to your signature on file. And we do have a number of signatures for you from your voter registration card. If you register to vote online, the signature on file is the same signature on your driver's license. But in the event that your signature does not compare or you forgot to sign your envelope, we will be contacting you. We'll be either contacting you through the email or phone number you give us on the envelope, or we'll be sending you a letter and you'll have opportunity to cure that up until two days before certification, which isn't until December 1st. And then just a reminder that no one can solicit the vote of a vote by mail voter or do any electioneering while you're in your residence uh, and during the time that you're voting. And any person who does that is guilty of a misdemeanor. So again, your, your vote is your secret, your privacy. You don't have to tell anybody how you're voting. Next slide, please. And then these are just some deadlines. We just got through candidate filing uh, closed on the 7th. And anybody who, if the incumbent did not file, we are extending those until Wednesday. We do a random alpha. If you've ever wondered how names appear on the, uh, what order on the ballot, a random alpha is done by the Secretary of State to determine the order of all local contests, and each county does a random order to determine uh, the order of names for State Senate and State Assembly. 
military and overseas ballots again September 4th, and that RAVBM stands for Remote Accessible Vote by Mail Balloting. And uh, the other good thing about that is with the uh, executive orders and the new legislation we have in order under the COVID environment, RAVBM is opened up to any voter. So it's not just military and overseas or voters with disabilities that normally that's who it's been reserved for. Again, ballots mailed out by October 5th. You got to get registered by the 19th. There's going to be voting uh, occurring Halloween through Election Day. Election Day is November 3rd, uh, polls open 7 to 8. And then we have our deadlines to certify. And uh, December 14th, that Electoral College meets. And January 20th is Inauguration Day. And the president takes office at noon. Next slide, please. So what can you do to promote the vote? And this is where we really need to enlist everybody because we do have these changes. So chalk art is great. Rock art. I love taking hikes in the county and finding art with uh, rocks with messages on them. Write messages on your car, social media, and be a trusted messenger. Let people know what's happening and, and the different groups that you're a member of. Talk it up everywhere you go and encourage family, friends to sign up, check up and track it. Next slide, please. So that's it, uh, that's my contact information and um, we certainly um, welcome any feedback on our election. So I think now we are going to open it up to, um, oh, am I still on? Um, we're gonna go ahead and open it up to questions. So is that what we're doing now, everybody? <laughs> there they are. Hello. I don't know why my screen's doing weird things now. Okay. So um, I don't see any questions in the chat. If any of our listeners are wanting to submit any questions, there's a place for you to do that on the cabriomusic.org website. So I will go ahead and ask a question here. Um, there we go. So it seems like, I mean, thank you all for your presentations. It's been very informative and very inspiring. It's inspiring. Um, and we've come a long way. Oh my gosh, hundred years is a lot to celebrate. But even after we won the right to vote and there were efforts to suppress the vote um, and women of color did not get full access to the ballot until decades later, what tactics do you see are being used today to keep people from voting? And what can we do to counteract those efforts of voter suppression? Should we open up with Bettina? Sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, um, I think um, there's just huge efforts being made to intimidate voters, um, to make it as hard as possible to register to vote. Uh, and it varies from state to state, just as uh, uh, Marla was talking about in, in the various states, there's various prohibitions. So California is very open about its voting procedures, um, but other states are not. And uh, the point about uh, purging voters in Ohio that Marla was also talking about, those vote that, for example, in Georgia, there have been millions of people purged. And another really important thing to, to say about suppression of the vote is in Florida, where the electorate voted by an overwhelming majority to allow people who were on, uh, who, who had been, who were felons, but had finished with their sentences, the vote of the popular vote was in a, in a proposition was to allow them to vote. And then the state legislature, which is Republican controlled did everything in its power to prohibit that by forcing people to have to pay their fines or pay court course or other things like that before they could register to vote, which basically prohibited it. It, it reversed what the popular vote had been. Um, and in Georgia, uh, the same thing is going on. And I just want to give a shout out to Stacey Abrams, who's just doing an amazing job all over the country in uh, fighting for voting rights. So it varies from state to state, but everything we can do to help encourage people to register to vote. Um, there's various organizations like Move On, for example, that you can join. You can phone people. 
They have this whole phone tree that you can do to encourage people to register to vote. And um, I also think there's great worry about intimidation. And, um, uh, you know, we have a, a federal apparatus right now that's very hostile to voting rights. So I think, I think we have to be very prepared to do everything in our power to encourage people to vote and to protect them. We have to do things to protect them so they can vote. Those are my Very thoughts. True. Very true, thank you. Aida or Marla, anything to add to that? Just briefly, I, I think prior to COVID, uh, polling places would have been a challenge. Uh, prior to COVID, I think uh, you know you have a lot of areas where they have consolidated uh, polling places. And so it makes it difficult for those who have to travel long distances in order to cast their vote in person or drop off a ballot. I think post COVID, the challenge is, is that even though California is mailing out ballots, they're mailing it out to the last address that's on file. And while a voter should update their information, they all, always don't. What you do have are folks who are your hourly wage earners who probably have a move a lot because of the price of, of renting as well as uh, following work. And so they may have a challenge if they have not updated their information and don't receive a ballot. So those are probably the two areas that impact. Aida, you're muted. I was trying to follow instructions. Uh, uh, I think that for Latinos and Latinas, uh, there, are may, there are a lot of barriers. One of them that's very um, prominent is language, right? So there's a lot of Spanish speakers in many areas. They do not translate um, voting materials. They don't know the process that well. And there's very little outreach uh, for the for generally. Uh, so that's one issue. And I think the other issue is much more generic. I think that... Um, there are now we have a very fragmented society with multiple channels of communication and information. And I think that the way that elections are run, we're not very sophisticated about how different working class people especially communicate with each other. So I have a colleague at UC Santa Barbara, uh, Professor Ines Casillas, who's written this brilliant chapter on um, how women use this um, app called What's Up, and they use it so well and so efficiently that if you really want to get voters, you learn how to use that app. And it's it's transnational how they communicate with each other through this um, through this app. And um, I think there's just a lot of fragmentation, a lot of confusion. And the more working class poor you are, the less you are reached by uh, mainstream channels. And so uh, I think for me, that's a real fear that it's, it's, it's systematically keeping people away from the knowledge necessary to, um, to mark their humanity through the ballot box. And, and that's very worrisome. Thank you. Okay, so we do have some questions in the chat. For some reason, it's not working for me, but um, one question was if you, plan to drop off your ballot at a ballot box, do you need to do so before November 3rd? Yes, the deadline to return a ballot is 8 p.m. November 3rd, either in person, one of our drop boxes. But again, if you do it to a postal service, get it stamped with the postmark. Um, a few more questions here. What is John Lewis's Voting Act goal? What is it trying to remedy? And go ahead, Bettina, and then I'll go after you. You want me to go first and then? Yes, yeah, go ahead. Well, okay, well, um, <clears throat> you, you really talked about it in the Shelby case. Um, <clears throat> um, so I haven't seen the exact wording of the legislation for the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, but the point is to try to put back into place mm -hmm. uh, the 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 strictures that were in place in the original 1965 Voting Rights Act mm -hmm. in states that are, to, so you have to show that various states are, are um, various states are discriminating against groups of people, particularly people of color, um, to be able to register to vote or to act. And I, I think uh, to be able to safely vote. And um, 
various points that were made about um, uh, removing voting po polling places and so forth to make it harder for people to vote. So my assumption, although I haven't seen the legislation itself, is that it's an update of the 1965 Voting Rights Act that would put back into place federal, at least some kind of federal jurisdiction about um, uh, voting rules and voting changes mm -hmm. that uh, can be shown to discriminate. That, yep. that would be my assumption. You probably yep. know more about it than I do. <laughs> I, I haven't seen the text, but I know uh, the Supreme Court just invalidated Section 4B. And Section 4B right. was the formula uh, utilized right. to determine which jurisdictions uh, are covered under the act and have engaged in historical uh, voter suppression. And so it would be to, again, update that and to provide uh, current data uh, because the court uh, deemed it unconstitutional because the data was old, not necessarily because of the language of, of the statute itself. And so it's to short up to be able to say current data, current information, here's our new coverage formula. These are the people who it applies to currently based on the data and the coverage formula. And section five was not declared unconstitutional. So then it, you would need to pre-clear. Thank you. Yeah, excellent. Mm -hmm. Exactly so. So we have another question here in the chat. What are we doing to ensure that the Postal Service doesn't willingly participate in voter suppression? Does anybody want to take that? Well, I'll start it. I can start that, which is there's a there's a huge campaign now to fund the post office. And uh, uh, the person in the White House has put in one of his mega donors as the postmaster general who doesn't know anything about the postal service. And um, I think the effort is to defund the postal service to such a degree that, it, that it's not able to handle the volume of mail that would be necessary um, in order to really have a, a vote by ballot, uh, to have voting by, uh, by mail a successful strategy. And it's, uh, I, you know, I find that very criminal at a time when you have the pandemic. And I, I remember a sign by a, a voter in Wisconsin, uh, Marla referred to that case in, in, in Wisconsin, where they were forced to vote and the pandemic was raging. And this guy was standing there with a sign that says, this is ridiculous. <laughs> and, um, so I think that we have to, there, there are campaigns to fund the post office. And I think that that's very important. I want to make one other point, which is a very large number of people who work for the post office are people of color. Mm -hmm. And it, it has been a source of uh, stability uh, mm -hmm. as a federal job with a lot of good benefits and, and retirement and so forth. So there's a, ra there's a racist edge to this, uh, mm -hmm. in my view, <laughs> um, that I think we should pay attention to as well. I do feel confident for California. I mean, we've been meeting with our postal reps and they are uh, they reassure us that the ballots are going to get mailed on time. And, and I'm just encouraging people once they get that ballot to return it, if possible, don't use the mail service, just drop it off on one of our boxes or drop it off in person. But if you have to use it, the mail service, just make sure it's postmarked. So. Okay, we have another question here about why are people concerned about fraud with the vote by mail or absentee ballot? They're probably worried about fraud because they're worried about people are gonna actually vote. <laughs> so <laughs> that's a red herring. Uh, yes, I think anything in life, you're going to have people who take advantage of a system and it, I mean, that, no matter what you do, there is nothing you know, perfect uh, that you can say is 100% perfect. What you're looking for is, are those things that have credibility to it? And our system has credibility. And I think people are raising it as a red herring. Yes, there will be uh, people who may try to take advantage of the system, but you have to stop and think. Who would take their time to take advantage of the system and really try to participate in this you know, because most people who, quote unquote, you know, have a supposed criminal mind 
that's a lot of energy and effort for them to put out to, you know, impact an election that they may or may not care about. So that to me, that's a, a red herring, you know, so and it, the pendulum swings both ways. So it doesn't matter which party is going to be claiming some sort of fraud. You know, it should equal itself out if both sides, you know, have people who are going to be doing the same thing, which I seriously doubt is going to occur because that's a lot of energy and effort for somebody to sit down to stop to think that I'm going to comp- commit perjury to try to sign somebody else's ballot, get it from somewhere, steal it some- from somewhere, and then mail it off. So um, that's an interesting thought in terms of voter fraud. It is like closing down polling places. It's like having two signatures on your ballot in order to, for it to be valid. It's like anything else where folks are afraid of the outcome of an election. So then they start, you know, if you don't have the facts, raise noise. I can tell you in my experience as the county clerk here in Santa Cruz County, and I've been doing it since 1993, I've had one case of voter fraud where a landlady did actually intercept the ballot for her tenant, voted it and returned it. And the studies that have been done by Pew and and Washington Post have shown that um, voter fraud for vote by mail ballots is minuscule, 0.000%, you know, very, very small. And I think the easiest way to uh, impact the vote is to spread lies and deceit on social media. It's a very cheap, easy platform to put things out there to discourage people and make people feel that they don't trust their vote and then they stay home and that's what the ultimate goal is. So, mm-hmm. um, so someone here says, what is Santa Cruz County's process for reaching voters who have moved versus dropping from the rolls? Um, you, you know, we all do the same thing. But, well, in California, we do have a statewide voter registration database. So if you move within the state of California, we catch up with you. But if you move out of state, um, when you re-register, you really need to provide your prior registration so that I get that data and I can update your record. But um, yeah, sometimes when you do move out of state, it's a little more problematic. But we do send out postcards uh, to voters and ask them if they're still there. If they're not, if we don't get a response from them, we put them on what we call the inactive file. So if they do show up to vote, they're reactivated uh, as long as they're registered at the same address or they could do same day registration. So California is much more uh, lenient as far as making sure voters have every opportunity to vote. Next question here. If Trump is reelected and any of the cases against him result in conviction, what happens? Or we have a judge who can help us with that one. (laughs) Yeah, Congress is gonna have to go back to impeachment procedures because that's the only way to remove a president is through impeachment. Right. (laughs) <laughs> okay I, I would prefer I would pre- if I could just say I would prefer to think that he's not reelected. <laughs> not to contradict what you're saying Marla but just really would hope that we okay can. <clears throat> someone asked uh, how do we check our signature on file and I can tell you for Santa Cruz County um, you can either come in or you can email me with your identifying information I'll send you a picture But if you did register to vote using the online system, your signature is the same signature on your driver's license. And again, if you don't have a signature, if you have a signature that doesn't compare and you sign up for ballot track, you're going to get that alert and you'll know. And there'll be a way to cure it super easy with a form that we'll post on our website that you just fill out and uh, return to me via email or fax. So you don't even have to show up in person. So we're really trying to minimize the in person. tasks that happen around election. And and I miss it because I do love that in-person personal touch, but um, we're having to be safe and adhere to all the protocols. So what advice do you have uh, for use to encourage people who say they don't intend to vote because they say it won't make it a difference? That's a good question. How do you encourage people to vote if they say it doesn't matter? Well, you know, I think that's what I was trying to uh, do with my presentation is to connect the political to the personal. And if you think about almost anything, if you're a, uh, you know, civically engaged person um, or you have family or you belong to a community, almost 
everything um, that affects our daily lives, including inside our homes, uh, are affected by elections. I, I, um, we, we have a family that's very civically engaged. Uh, our son is a supervisor in San Francisco, Matt Haney, and my sister is um, just working with the new DA, first one ever in our family. We've always had public defenders. I was working with the newly elected DA in San Francisco who's trying to rethink the criminal justice system and prosecution to include the notion that um, we are here to help people do better, not here to criminalize them and incarcerate them. And it, it, it's just amazing how these, um, these two examples have changed massive kinds of policy issues just by what they do in elected office. And it reaffirmed for me in a very personal way that in, in getting brilliant young people into office um, matters and that they will do the job that has been done in the same way for, <laughs> for hundreds uh, you know, of years now will be rethought so that, you know, uh, Alexandra Ocasio is another good example of somebody who speaks her mind and, and, and stands up for her constituency and there's political peril. And she does, she's, she has said over and over, and in fact, I was going to quote her that she didn't go, she didn't go to office to get reelected. She went there to do her job. And if that doesn't get her reelected, then that's the consequence of her uh, meeting her, um, her obligation to being elected. And certainly that's, that's the, exp that's the thought that our son has also expressed to us. So I think that, that it's really time for us to rethink how we channel young, brilliant people, which I never had before. I always said, hey, become a professor, become a teacher, but I never said explicitly run for office. And I think it's time. It's time for us to make the connection between everything we care about and that mark on that ballot, um, and especially in this election. Uh, I think that a lot of things are on the line that will affect our entire society's future, including, uh, you know, exercising democracy. If if I could just if I could just add uh, one one thing here, um, you know, this is the most consequential election I think in our lifetimes, and I'm I'm saying that as someone. <clears throat> who um, <clears throat> has been through a lot and lived a long time. Um, and one of the reasons, and we haven't mentioned this, is uh, global the glo uh, is global warming and, um, and, and also the dangers of nuclear war. Mm -hmm. Th these are global issues. These are things that are going to affect the entire planet. And I think it's an absolute priority that uh, the, the folks in Washington now just have to, the, the Republicans, I'll be explicit, have to be defeated in overwhelming numbers. And it's not just about the United States now. And we're significant, we're important. People in this country are suffering greatly. Uh, there's been such levels of incompetence and corruption, but it's on a qualitatively different level when you think about global warming and climate change and you read the stories about what's happening in so much of the world. And 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 uh, the pullout from the, uh, the global agreements that we've had and uh, the the situation with Iran these are terribly dangerous in North Korea and China I mean they're terribly dangerous terribly dangerous and they involve the planet they involve all life on the planet and if if we have to see that and we have to be willing to uh, to vote. We have this opportunity. It's not the be all and the end all, but it's a very important qualitative opportunity at this time. And I'd like to add that your vote matters because you matter. Good. And if you believe you matter, then you will vote. And the reason why you want to vote and matter is because somebody gave their life mm -hmm. so that you had this right. And you honor those who gave their life for you to have this right by you voting. There are local elections, there are state elections that are of importance that your vote matters for, as well as the national election. And if you believe in democracy, then exercise your right to vote. When we become complacent and sit 
and don't do anything because we don't think it matters, then we're saying democracy doesn't matter. And democracy matters. So get a ballot, vote, because democracy matters and you matter. And because those two things matter, that's why we have a great nation. Very well said. And I, I can't tell you how many elections are, are won based on the fact that people who stayed home and didn't vote. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and how many elections are very close where one or two votes determines who the winner is uh, and who's, who's not. So yes, it's very extremely important. Um, we have another question here about, can we discuss California's Prop 17 to restore voting rights to people on parole, policing and uh, criminalization of communities of color, Black Lives Matter, et cetera? Oh, and I should say we're, we're allowed to go till 1240. So we got eight more minutes so we can get some of these last questions in. Well, that's why your vote matters is you get to, you know, weigh in on policy. So it is the voters right to weigh in on policy. So go out, whatever your view is on the particular policy, mark your ballot. I would say your vote is your voice. Just, so just somebody asks, when do early votes and mail-in votes begin to be counted? So um, there was a law that changed that allows county elections offices in the state of California to process ballots as they come in. But processing is, you know, we check the signature, we verify the ballot, we inspect the ballot, we get it ready for a count, we put it through the scanner, but we can't hit tally until after the polls close on Tuesday, uh, November 3rd at 8 p.m. So under this new law, we are able to process them sooner uh, than prior. We used to, the law used to give us 10 days, but now we get the full amount of time. But that's if we have them. If people aren't voting those ballots and returning them early, then I'm not going to have anything to do till the ballots come in. So we really want to try to flatten that voting curve and have people vote early. Another question here was, how am I going to keep poll workers COVID safe, shorter hours, plexiglass screens? Yes, we will be complying with all the public health orders for masks and We'll have the sneeze guards and we'll have hand sanitizer and disinfectant. So, you know, that's why we're limiting the number of facilities uh, because we have fewer people to, to staff them and we wanna be able to control the environment and they need to be large enough to allow for physical distancing. So there's a can question I, here. Can I just go back to the question about Prop 17 for a minute? Yes, yes. If that's all right. Yes. I just wanna to add to what Marla was saying about, about that, which is, um, it's very connected to the issue of mass incarceration and the disproportionate number of people of color who are incarcerated, not only in California, but all over the country. And that's, a, that's another issue and other politics. But it, it's connected to the fact that all of these initiatives to try to give uh, people who are uh, on parole or have completed their sentences and so forth the right to vote is to restore a sense of um, citizenship to them and to restore a sense of dignity to them and to restore a sense that they have a say and a vote and a meaning in their lives. And this is very important. It's a very important aspect, uh, personal. That's the personal that Aida was talking about in terms of helping people to, uh, to regroup after they've been incarcerated. And it also helps to enhance uh, change in how uh, there are efforts to curtail the votes of people of color. And one other thing I wanted to say, because Aida talked about AOC, uh, uh, Alexandria, I, I wanted to say her speech on the floor of Congress, where she condemned the sexual harassment and bullying, was a very important moment that was nationally televised and it's still being shown and shown. And that again shows you the importance of the initiative all these people that are registered are seeking uh, office now. And uh, there was a surprise victory by a woman in Tennessee. Um, I think and her name is Makita uh, Bradshaw, who just won the primary in the Democratic election in Tennessee. Out of the, and she had almost no money and she had momentum and she got there on the ballot and she she won the primary. So there's this wonderful moment of possibility. And I just, I wanted to emphasize that about Prop 17 and 
people voting just add add to the chorus of what we're saying. Yeah. I see from some of the other questions that there's um, confidence in the California system, but there's concern about what's happening in other states. Um, you know, someone raised concerns about the New York primaries and seeing long delays with counting. You know, my response to that is do you want it done faster, you do want it run right. And sometimes, I mean, democracy takes time. And so while some states will take longer, I think that I'd rather have it right in the end. Um, and one person expressed uh, concern about uh, feeling very overwhelmed by all the obstacles to voting and um, what can we do to help at the national level? And, and there are state, uh, no state is sending ballots out to anybody. Um, they have to be a registered voter who's active with known addresses in order to get a ballot. But, um, but there, are, there are provisions for people who are homeless if you don't have a home you can still register and we just need to set up a mailbox for you through general delivery or through one of the shelters in town. So there's lots of opportunities there, but, but how, do we, how, do we, how do we help na nationally? What, what count can we do here in California? Look, I'll just give a shout out to an organization called Four Directions. It's, an, it's, it's run by indigenous people and it's based in Arizona and in and in the Dakotas, and they have been registering Native Americans to vote. And you know, the res sometimes the reservations are not only very poor, but they're over huge, vast areas. And so they've been working out. They've been they've been doing this now for years, uh, for several years. And if you want to look them up online and help them, I think that would be a terrific initiative, uh, because in certain states, the Native American vote is very important. And Arizona is one of them, and they made a difference in the last election. Um, and the Dakotas are very important. So that's one example. I think the NAACP has enormous initiatives uh, for uh, voter registration all over the country. And so there's ways in which if we're online and we can interact with these organizations or groups, we can help people to, um, you know, to organize and to work. It's going to take... Democracy is going to take a lot. It's going to take a lot of all of our shoulders to the wheel to make democracy work in this election. But mm -hmm. I think we've got a lot of folks working on it. And I think we can. I just got an email uh, before I started the, the program from uh, a friend, Ciel Benedetto, and she says she works with the Reclaim Our Vote organization, and they fill out... Um, postcards and they send them to voters in other states and they pick a state. She's working with Texas. So there's a lot of different ways you can participate even if you're situated in California. So unfortunately, all good things must come to an end and our time is up. So I wanna thank you all for joining us today. A special thank you to our distinguished panel, Bettina Apiker, Aida Hurtado and Judge Marla Anderson. And another huge thank you to our sponsors, the Cabrillo Festival of Contemporary Music, the Humanities Institute at UC Santa Cruz, the Peggy and Jack Baskin Foundation Presidential Chair in Feminist Studies and Bookshop Santa Cruz. And thank you to our co-sponsors, NAACP, Temple Beth El, Women Lawyers of Santa Cruz County. I wanna invite you to join us tonight at 5 p.m. for the world premiere performance of Stacey Garrup's The Battle for the Ballot, commemorating the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment and featuring the Cabrillo Festival Orchestra. You can access the virtual event at the cabrillomusic.org website. We also have a wonderful art exhibit here on the third floor in the county building called Your Vote Is Your Voice that was put together by Maria Gittin. I encourage you all to take some time to come view that. Thank you all for joining us. I leave you with this. There is no force more powerful than a woman determined to rise. And so we shall. Thank you all very much.